do. That is how I'm saying hello in a bird language I made up. And I am encouraging you and inviting you to make your own sound. So feel free. Do you have anything, Ed? <laughs> uh, these sounds are what we hear around us. Um, birds are all around us. Many of them have been living here well before we've been here and we're hoping that they continue to live on and on long after we are gone. This session, um, we are going to try to share ways that you can help them simply by counting them by sight or by sound or helping them by providing certain kind of things for them in your backyard or um, just simply appreciating them because they're worth being appreciated. So I am Carly Rose, the Community Engagement Manager with the Environmental Science Center. We're an organization that started 20 years ago, primarily focusing on marine systems, learning about shoreline animals and salmon, and have branched out to learn about birds and the plants uh, that are all here within our watershed. We operate mostly in South King County in Washington. So I do wanna take the time to acknowledge that I am here on ancestral land of many Coast Salish people and we want to honor those members of the past, those who are very much alive today, and those who are coming in the future. We are very grateful for these Native storytellers and these educators who are sharing their intrinsic knowledge about the birds and also sharing their Native language. Here it's the shoot seed, and we're learning more about the names that these animals have had since time immemorial. We're hoping to share some of those with you in an upcoming event called Bird Fest. We're very grateful that we're able to do these events uh, in sponsorship from the city of Burien to help people learn about what is happening in the watershed and ways that they can make a difference of it. Birds are a big part of this. They're everywhere and we're hoping that you can take part um, in whatever way you can and joining us in another event in February that's also sponsored by the city of Burien. So even though we cannot see each other like we normally can, we can see your questions. So if you are here on Zoom, you can ask them through the question and answer portal or through the chat, and we will be looking at those questions for live answers. I'll also monitor Facebook um, to see if there's any questions out there too. This is the final session of um, our Protecting Our Watershed series, and it's called Making Birds Count. I am joined here by our naturalist, Ed Dominguez of this region, who has been so helpful in teaching me about birds and helping many others um, learn about birds as well. So I'm going to briefly do um, an introduction about different ways that you can help count birds in your area. And then we're gonna do a deep dive with Ed to help find out who's who in your backyard or in your neighborhood by different um, visuals that you can pick up on or ways that you can help bring them into your yard. So I will start um, with my presentation here. Give me a second to get this started. And oops. Okay. So I just want to say, if you can count, you can help birds. It's really that simple. There are tons of birds out there, but you can help even a small amount of them in your backyard. And that small amount can make a big difference on the large scale of community science with birds. And I'm just going to try to level the field here because a lot of people get overwhelmed by how many different kinds of birds there are. So just take a look at the screen and count. How many birds are on the screen? If you counted five, you're right. If you counted 10, hurrah. If you counted 13, then you counted them all. But the reality is if you just counted one of these birds, then you're making that one bird count for research, which is really, really important. And that's the main message here. And of these birds, how many do you recognize? If I said, can you point out an owl? or a duck, would you feel comfortable with that? Or maybe a heron or a woodpecker or a crow? 
there are simple little tools you can use to help figure out what those kind of birds are and what they're not. And so that's what we're going to go over simply tonight, too. So four keys to bird IDs that I use are what does it look like? What does it sound like? Where is it? And what is it doing? And what does it look like can be the shape like you just picked out, probably an owl on here or the silhouette of a, of a duck to help you out. But there's also size and there's coloration and patterns. Those really can fill in those blanks. What does it sound like? If you're hearing chickadee dee dee, you likely have a chickadee that's around, unfortunately, um, by that call. There are different taps you will hear from woodpeckers. Those things help you clue into what's out there. And where is it is important because there are some birds that are not going to be up super high in the trees. They'll only be really low on the ground. And there's some birds that are in salt water versus fresh water. So knowing where it is an important thing as well, as well as when with migrations um, happening too. And what's it doing? Certain birds like certain things, just like people like certain things. So some of them only like seeds, some of them like berries. Um, some are gonna be in certain places eating insects. So all these things can help you figure out what the bird is and also what it's not at the time. And these things can help you count the birds that are out there. These are all counts that you can do starting from tomorrow through February. And there are more that happen throughout the year, but I just wanted to give you a, a couple of these to do, which are really exciting. Uh, I put an outline here, but then we'll go specifically um, quickly about what things are happening. So Project Feeder Watch is one that you can do starting now. The Audubon Christmas bird counts are happening and they happen across the nation. They're even happening in South America as well. So between December and January is when they'll happen and just depends on what chapter of the local Audubon Society is hosting some of these for you to participate in. And we have at least two I'm gonna talk about tonight. And then the Great Backyard Bird Count is something that happens across the world, which is super exciting. So starting tomorrow, if you sign up, you can take part in Project Feeder Watch, which the Cornell Lab of Ornithology is hosting for a North American count. And though it is called Feeder Watch, you don't have to have a feeder. The intention is to find out what birds are coming to your space. And that could be having birds drawn in by the plants that are in your yard or the water source that is there. And these ones will be counted from November 14th through April 9th. And you will be counting birds over two consecutive days. And I believe giving the total of those two days through this program, this project. And you just can't count um, those. They have to be five days apart. So you, can, you have to space your counts out a bit. And this one um, is the only one we're talking about that isn't free. This one helps fund this project. But in that funding, you're not only helping science and research, you're getting a really neat kit that helps you with research. So if you don't know what the birds are in the backyard, you're going to get posters, you're going to get brochures, and you're going to get um, a whole thing that even helps you learn about ways to bring birds to your yard. And a quick tip, you can go there right now and download these like I did tonight so that you can get a good idea yourself for any of these upcoming um, counts as well, which is really cool. Especially if you need to figure out sparrows, you tend to have to have like pictures um, to figure out which one it is and which one it isn't, which is exciting. And the big, big thing that's happening right now is Audubon is having their 121st Christmas bird count. So even in a pandemic, we are still able to do certain counts around the nation safely and through social distancing and sometimes in the comforts of our own home. So we can stay warm while the birds are outside in the cold. And this is a map that you can find out through going online to Audubon Society, where all these circles show where these counts are happening. And when you hover over them, a little box will come up like this indicates about what's happening. Um, so this can give you an idea and you can find out if something is happening in your region. In our region out here in, in King County, here are the circles that there will, um, that the counts typically happen. So as a scientific protocol, it is done the same way every year. The counts happen within these circles and 
if you're outside of the circle, you can still count, but you won't be counting within the Christmas bird count. You'll, you'll be submitting your data um, in another way that will still be counted, but not in this official count itself. So Christmas bird count is happening with Seattle Audubon. If your house falls within this circle, then you are able to do their feeder watch, which is happening on Saturday, December 6th. And you can go online and find out more information about submitting the data. Here's an example, um, a screenshot of their website. So you can quickly find information, click on that, and then submit the data that day to help them figure out what's happening. You can also participate in a virtual celebration. It sounds like they are gonna be having one of those instead of the ones that they typically do. Rainier Audubon over here further in the south is also having their Christmas bird count. I believe it's their 40th, which is exciting. So they're gonna be doing it in January. And if you live in this region, like I do, then you can make the beginning of your count by counting some birds. And they also are going to be doing a virtual celebration, which you can check out through their website. If you go to, um, go to Rainier Audubon, just type that in, you'll find it easily. And they have all the information here on their website to just click on to the forms you need to fill out and ways to get into that celebration, which is really cool. So even if you're not in those circles though, you can still submit data through eBird, which a lot of these projects are using as their base for information. So just like it sounds, eBird, eBird.org can give you more information about that on getting an account started which you can do tomorrow as well. And that's also the way that we're gonna be logging information for the great backyard bird count, which happens in February every year over four days. And this one's gonna go through the 12th to the 15th. So when somebody says, I don't know if I'm gonna be around for that event, I'm gonna say, you're gonna be somewhere for those four days. Just take 15 minutes to count some birds anywhere you are. You can find more information about this as well at the Great Backyard Bird Count website, which is birdcount.org. The great thing about this, count them anywhere, in your backyard, go on a walk, you can go to a nature center and you're gonna count for just 15 minutes. So you'll track the time, but you can count more than that too, which is really, really exciting. And you want to be counting every single bird that you find, every single species that you find so that scientists and researchers can find out where these birds are. And again, these are going into eBird. It's an online site to gather all this information. You can do it online. You can do it from your phone. There's now an app for that, which is exciting. So you can do checklists each day, each new place that you go to. Um, if you're the same place or a new time, you can start logging that information as well. And there is a whole presentation online similar to this to show you visually how to submit the data. But just for a quick um, summary, it's very simple. You're just gonna submit where you're at so they know where to log the birds. You're gonna state the date, the time that you did it. Did you stand still or did you walk around to do um, a count? And most importantly, what birds did you identify? What birds did you see or what birds did you hear? How many chickadees? We've got 10 black cat chickadees they put in here, three crows. If there were some gulls flying around that you could identify, I think you can even put in just gull species. But it's really important to make sure you count every single bird here and then submit it. And if you're here, you enjoy birds, you appreciate birds. But most importantly, why participate in this? Because unless you have a scientist in your household, they're not counting the birds in your backyard. So you get to do the submissions. You get to tell people what birds you're seeing and then sometimes what birds you're not because that's really important too for them to figure out long-term what are the fluctuations, what's happening, what's the migration pattern. Are there insects that are, are not here what they used to be? Are, are seeds changing and, and um, are plants coming out at different times? is their development. All these things can be seen once there's a large scale of data to put the pieces together. And it's global, which I think is really exciting. So if you're feeling, you know, like 
you're alone right now and it's the end of the year and we're going through a pandemic, there's, there's a lot of really serious um, tragic things happening, but there's also the ability for us to connect and to help the birds. So you can make a difference every single day and you're not alone in this. This count is happening across the world. Just to show you last year, 194 countries participated. We had 300,000 nearly participating in this. And those numbers go up every year by the thousands. So there are people who care and the more people that have access and know about this, the more that we can count the birds that are all around us. So again, a lot of this goes on to eBird, which you can do whether you're doing any of these counts or not. You can do this every single day. And I've been doing this as I've been walking around my neighborhood and you can have bird lists online and you can share them with people, even just to track what's in your backyard. And you can edit these two as well and share them, like I said, which is really neat. So we're hoping you take part in the backyard bird count. We're also hoping you take part in bird fest, which the environmental science center has been doing for the last couple of years to promote the great backyard bird count. The city of Burien is sponsoring this even in a virtual format that it seems like it will be this February on the 13th. So stay tuned about more information to come on this. We're learning how to operate in this new format. We will not be out in groups like we were last year. 150 people came out to this event and we were able to track the birds as you can see. This is an example of what gets submitted for those counts to eBird. We had some really great interactions where people were doing hands-on activities with owl pellet dissections and Seattle Audubon had their real live dead bird specimens there for people to check out things. We may not have those in person, but we're looking to do um, more creative outlets and having people like Ed, who did a presentation there last year, joining us again next year. So there is a lot to come and we hope that you'll join us for Bird Fest and more activities that we have. Uh, you can check things out on our website, environmentalsciencecenter.org, to find out some of these events. And just to find out more about the watershed and ways you can help it, you can go to our resources page where we have native plant guides and marine species guides and information about salmon just to help you learn new ways and to solidify that what you're doing is making a difference. So I thank you for tuning into that. And I'm glad you are here to tune in for Ed. If you do not know Ed Dominguez, then I'm glad you are here tonight. Um, Ed is a naturalist who is supernatural in this region about sharing information um, in a way that people absorb it easily and can sense the passion um, that he has. So I'm very delighted that we have Ed here. He has been an educator and outdoor leader in the Pacific Northwest for over 30 years, and he is happy to share information in many different ways. You may have been with him when he was leading, he was lead naturalist at the Seward Park Audubon Center. He also worked with North Cascades Institute, and for 25 years, he's been um, a scramble leader, mountaineering with the mountaineers. So there's a lot of different, a breadth of information that he comes with. And right now he is getting wild, he has a YouTube channel that we've been following and sharing information on uh, because he just wants to help people learn about the, their back, backyards, their back doors, their neighborhoods and their streams and any ways that they connect with the natural environment. So we are very pleased to have Ed here to share who's who out there. So with that, Ed, take it away. Thank you, Carly. Um, and it's a pleasure to be here, and I'd like to thank the Environmental Science Center at Seahurst Park for inviting me to speak. They're a great organization that does fantastic education work with a lot of school age groups from, you know, young primary grades up through high school and with adults. And if you've never been down to Seahurst Park, it's down in Burien, it's on Puget Sound, it, beautiful blend of uh, saltwater and beach park and then forested trails that go through the trees. I've led some uh, outings through there. It's a wonderful place to go visit. So Seahurst Park, it's just a super place to be. Well, 
I would like to talk with you about enjoying birds in your backyard. Um, my talk will take place in three parts. First of all, I want to talk about if you've never had a bird feeder before, I'll tell you about what feeders work best in our area and what kind of foods to go in them and some related issues dealing with feeders, keeping them clean, what happens if you get you know, rodents around, because some people think, oh, I'd love to put out a bird feeder, but I'm worried I might get a rat or two, or we'll talk about that. Part two, which is really a cool part, is that once you get these feeders out, observing bird behaviors and seeing what they do and how they go about their lives, which is fascinating. And then the third part, uh, we will identify some of the birds that you're likely to see in your backyard once you get your feeders out. And I'll give you some tips for helpful identification. And I'll finish with um, a, a little bit of a, a beautiful scientific essay on our hummingbirds. Our Anna's hummingbird is one of our resident hummingbirds. But um, like I like to say, one of my big axioms of nature, everything is smarter than we think it is. And I'm going to show you a little bit about the hummingbird's tongue that is going to, you know, blow you away. And then we will have a question and answer period. And I think also if you have questions during the presentation, if you put them up on the Q&A, Carly can relay them and I'm happy to answer them as we go. So with the miracle of technology, let me uh, put up this program and we'll get started. Maybe. Are we on, Carly? Good to go. Okay, great. Well, fall and winter backyard birds. And we have here a black cap chickadee, one of the coolest birds for many people. The black cap and a white cheek, kind of a buffy breast. And this is the bird that makes the beautiful chickadee dee 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 that will be in your backyard, I guarantee it, if you put out a bird feeder. So attracting fall and winter birds to your yard. Well, I probably don't have to give much of a sales pitch here because if you're tuning into this session, you love birds, you're interested in birds, you want to learn more about birds, but I've got a tip that if anyone questions or says, well, why do you want to feed birds? For the latest science, you can tell them, I am going to my happy place because the latest neuroscience shows that when you learn a bird, and then you see that bird again, like say you're not familiar with a chickadee, you learn what the chickadee is, and then the chickadee appears in your backyard or out on a walk, you get a little shot of dopamine. You get an endorphin high off recognizing that bird. It becomes something familiar to you. And the more birds you learn, every time you see them, guess what? You're getting little shots of dopamine. And in this time of year, where a lot of people have seasonal affective disorder. We've all are struggling, as Carly said, with the year 2020. Boy, I'm ready for a new year. Um, getting this little shot of endorphins by seeing birds is a great way to boost your mental health and get some wellness going for yourself. And um, it might be habit forming, but there's nothing addictive or bad about it, like some other substances maybe we might try. I've heard the sales of wine have gone up uh, incredibly during the pandemic. <laughs> anyway, it's a natural way to give your brain a little boost. And the more you learn, the more you want to learn. So there's every reason for putting up some bird feeders and getting familiar with our birds. So I wanna talk about if you've never set up a bird feeding station, what kinds of feeders, what kind of food to go in those feeders, a little bit about the importance of water, which you might think, eh, it's Pacific Northwest, there's water everywhere. 
and then predators on the birds, squirrels, and rodent issues. So it's a pretty scene, isn't it? A nice summer scene. There's lilacs blooming. Uh, it's very inviting. Well, it's not only inviting to us, but guess what? If you're a bird flying around and you see that, it looks inviting for you too. And if you come in and you see on the left, two plastic tube feeders, those are what we call tube seed feeders. And then there's a little glass bowl that's a hummingbird feeder. So a yard like this where you have flowering plants and it doesn't have to be a, a big yard like this. You can have a, a flower pot on your windowsill, on your deck or on your front porch wherever you have a spot where you can have a flower and a bird feeder, you'll get birds coming by. When they see something like this, they naturally go in to investigate. So we have tube feeders, and then we have hummingbird feeders, and then we have something called suet. Black oil sunflower is the number one food for seed of seeds that I, I recommend. For us here in the Pacific Northwest, it is a high protein, high fat, high energy food that's attractive to every species of bird we have here in the Northwest. In some supply areas, you might see striped sunflower seeds, which are kind of gray and have two white stripes on them. Those are large and a little bit thicker for some of our smaller birds to crack open. But black oil sunflower is a small sunflower that has a thin shell that's very easy for birds of all types big beaked or small beaked to crack open and get that nutritious seed. Suet is another very good feeder. Suet is essentially beef tallow, rendered beef fat from around the kidneys and the heart of, of cattle. And it's rendered so that it doesn't go rancid. It's made into a cake and then many times is filled with an additional attractive substance such as sunflower seeds or bits of crushed peanuts, insect bits. And it too, particularly in the winter, provides a high fat, high protein, high energy food for birds. Peanuts are very good. Um, my Stellar's Jays love to come around and get peanuts and uh, they will come by and thank you for it. And boy, are they entertaining when they do come. Uh, Niger is a very thin seed, sometimes called thistle. It's native to India and it attracts one particular species of native bird that we have that you'll see in a minute, the uh, American goldfinch and then hummingbird nectar. So there's a variety of foods that you can use. Let's explore each of those. So our black oil sunflower, again, a very rich, high fat, high protein food, easy to crack open, and all birds love it. Additionally, it's not an expensive food, so it's not gonna break your pocketbook. Now you see this black capped chickadee has got a seed, and notice how he's perched on what appears to be the outer cage, and there's a silver inner cage that has the seeds in it. That is a double tube feeder, and I recommend that type of feeder because we have a lot of Eastern gray squirrels in our neighborhood and Eastern gray squirrels love peanuts. And if they can get to or, uh, seed, sunflower seed, and if they can get to your sunflower seed, they will just hang out on that feeder and eat to their heart's content and down goes your seed level. And then you have to spend more and the birds haven't gotten anything. Not that we don't love our squirrels, but uh, people who like to feed birds all around the world are all, all, always battling, how do I get the feed to the, to the birds and not the squirrels? I'll give you some ideas on that. But a double cage feeder is a nice way where the bird can perch on the outer cage, reach its head through to the inner cage, pick out the sunflower seed and enjoy it. Squirrels can't get through that outer cage. So black oil sunflower a great food. Here's our suet cake, the, the beef fat. This one looks like it's got little bits of sunflower seed in it. Again, notice it's on a double cage so that squirrels can't get in and gnaw on that suet because they'll love that too. Particularly in winter, that high fat of suet really helps birds with their metabolism to battle off the cold and it can attract a variety of birds. You can see we have on the right, the little chestnut back chickadee, notice his beautiful chestnut brown back and a pileated woodpecker hanging upside down. So you've got the small and the large both enjoying the same kind of food. So suet is very nice. You can have suet along with black oil sunflower in a tube feeder if you have room for both of them. If you only have one room for one, 
Um, suet is probably the very easiest to put out because you just put the cake in the feeder and hang it. But pouring some sunflower seed in the tube isn't too demanding either. If you have room for both, I would recommend both. Otherwise, one or the other is great. This is the American goldfinch, the Washington state bird. And it's actually the state bird of, I think, five different states, but we'll claim it as ours. It's a beautiful yellow, lemon yellow bodied finch with a black wing, white wing bar, and a beautiful black cap. Notice that thick beak. That's very, very diagnostic of the finch family. They have a really heavy beak that's good at cracking open seeds of all kinds. But this beautiful heavy beaked bird likes these little thin niger seeds. So if you really want to draw in goldfinches, you have to buy a tube that's designed for niger seed because the seed is so slender that it'll fall out of the ports of a black oil sunflower seed tube. So niger seed tubes have little slits in them or they sell mesh bags that also uh, the seeds, the bird can pick the seed through the holes in the mesh bag. And it will particularly draw in uh, the goldfinch. Now, in our area, American goldfinches tend to be kind of locally concentrated. Like up by the Arboretum, there's a big flock of goldfinches. I just live a couple miles south of the Arboretum, and as much as I put out Niger seed, I've never get any goldfinches coming into my yard. Occasionally, a couple will come in and have some black oil sunflower, but I don't get them to stay for very long. But this is the seed to use if you want to draw them in. Um, niger seed is rather volatile. The oils in it will go bad. So if you do have niger out, you want to change it for sure every month. You can probably get away with a little longer in cold weather. But in warm weather, you know, for sure every three days. And you don't want to let it dry out because once the oils dried out from the seed, the goldfinches aren't interested anymore. So if you want to draw this particular lemon yellow beauty, niger is the way to go. And then our hummingbirds, which are for many of us, one of our absolute favorites, favorites of birds. These guys are incredible mighty mites. They love nectar, but they eat all kinds of foods. They eat spiders, they eat insects, they eat insect eggs, they eat larvae. They'll drink nectar, of course, from flowers. If you have some winter blooming camellias, they'll be all over those right now. Um, they like pollen, they're pollen eaters. So they eat a variety of foods. But in the winter, this little tiny hummingbird survives the cold nights by going into a kind of a mini hibernation, a torpor. So they'll fly up into a tree, someplace sheltered and out of the wind, they'll hunker down. And the heart rate of this little guy, which even at resting is somewhere between near 300 to 600 beats a minute. And when they're flying, it's you know 1200 to 1600 beats a minute. Their little heartbeat drops down to about 40 beats or less per minute. Their respiration drops way down. Their body temperature drops to just a little bit above the ambient outside temperature. They basically go into a mini hibernation. And that's how they survive the cold. But when they awake in the morning, they need food. And particularly this time of year, if you have some hummingbird nectar out in a hummingbird feeder, it does a great job of jump-starting their metabolism and getting them revved up to go around and find food for the day, spiders, insects, all the foods I mentioned earlier. So it's a great way to keep your hummers going and they'll keep coming back and thanking you and you get to enjoy them. Hummingbird nectar is e easy to make. The formula that most closely matches the sugar content of, of native plants is four parts water to one part white sugar. And you wanna use just like CNH granulated pure cane sugar. Don't use any sugar that has molasses or syrup or honeys or any brown sugar, which is basically white sugar with molasses on it. Just use pure white cane sugar. You bring, say most hummingbird feeders hold two cups of water. Bring two cups of water as it starts to boil on the stove. Stir in a half a cup of white sugar, kind of stir it so it doesn't stick to the bottom. As the water comes to a boil again, you keep stirring, it'll dissolve. Turn the heat off the stove, let it cool, and fill your feeder, and the hummingbirds will be thanking you. Um, you want to refill the, the feeder. This time of year, you can leave it out for as long as two weeks. In the summer, you want to change it every week and clean the feeder because, you know, the heat of the summer will cause the sugar to, to, to turn, ferment and then turn rancid. But this time of year, a couple weeks is fine. So easy to put out a hummingbird feeder. 
Then you want always want to have water available. And here in the Pacific Northwest, you know, liquid sunshine, the evergreen state, water, water, water. When I first moved up here from California, people were saying, well, you better take your webbed feet. It's all it does is rain. Well, however, in the winter, we get some cold spells and things freeze over. So if things are frozen for a week or so in your backyard, we drop down into the 20s, put a little dish of water out there. So it really helps the birds. They need to find fresh water to drink. And then during other times of the year, say in summer when we don't have a lot of rain, uh, water is good for them for, for bathing and for uh, keeping uh, their feathers clean. And if you have running water, like a little drip mechanism, every bird is attracted to running water. So you will have them in your yard. If you don't have a system for running water, just a, a bird, bird bath will do a lot for birds. They'll come by. So water is important. All right, bird behavior. What's going on out there? This is a little bird called a ruby crown kinglet that spends its summers up in the high cascades and in the Olympics. And then as the snows fall as they are now, they come down here to the lowlands and they have a beautiful crest of, you know, scarlet red feathers that they can erect on top of their head. The males do when they want to warn another male that you're getting too close, you're in my space, man. Or they want to advertise to all the female uh, kinglets out there. So birds have some interesting behaviors, sometimes uh, displayed by different colored feather plumage they can show. And this is really, for me, one of the great things about setting up a backyard bird feeding system is that you start to watch the birds, you start to see patterns in their behavior, and then you kind of just get into it, seeing what they're doing and following what they do based on their particular species and individuals within their species. So we can divide the bird behaviors into two types, maintenance behaviors and social behaviors. So social behaviors consist of interactions, gestures and sounds, what they do if there's a predator around and how the birds will come to the feeder. Now, this time of year, you hear a lot of people say, and I've heard it since I was a little kid, even where I grew up in California, the snowbirds are back, the snowbirds are back. And what they're referring to is a, a sparrow bird we have called the dark-eyed junco that I'm going to show you a slide of momentarily that for most of the summer season are in pairs and or sometimes just individuals. But when winter comes and food becomes scarce, um, they along with many other species of birds start to tolerate large groups of them. The proximity isn't nearly as threatening as it is when they're trying to find a mate or establish a territory. So you'll see bunches of these birds. They are non-migratory, so they're here all the time. But since they come back in clusters around fall and winter, people will say the snowbirds are back. So many birds will start coming in large aggregate groups around your feeders, thinking, OK, we can all be friends as long as there's a good food supply here, because everybody can enjoy you know, the rewards of the feeders, whereas other times of the year, they might not be so tolerant. The interactions of birds, many times you'll see mated pairs working together. Sometimes the males will feed the females at the feeder, will get a seed and feed it to them. And you go, oh, what's that? How nice. Or sometimes some juvenile birds that were born this year might still be hanging around and you'll see them get fed. Many birds that you'll see at your feeder have some different feeding behaviors. You might get house finches that come to your feeder and when they land on the sunflower tube, they just hang out there and like to nibble away, uh, completely ob oblivious to the fact that bunches of other birds are waiting their turn on the feeder and finally some other bird will get bold and swoop in on the feeder and make the house finch fly away. Um, but that They'll hang out there and just eat to their heart's content. Whereas the black-capped chickadees that we saw, they like to come in, select just the right seed, take it, and then fly off to a nearby branch where they'll crack the seed open. So different birds have different feeding patterns. Some like to feed on the feeders. Some like to feed down on the ground below the feeders. And as we get to the individual identification slides, I'll tell you what their feeding habits tend to be. Alarm behaviors. You get bunches of birds at a bird feeder and you'll have predators such as Cooper's hawks come flying in thinking, ah, here's breakfast for me at the bird feeder. Or maybe the neighbor's cat takes a stroll through your backyard. You can see the bird behavior. They're always looking and listening. 
Remember that chickadee sound that I made earlier? That's actually their alarm call. And the number of DDDDs indicate the, the level of danger. If it's just chickadee, dee, 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 it's like yellow alert. If there's a D D D D D D D D, a bunch of those syllables, it means red alert, red alert, the cat's coming towards us, or Cooper's hawk. And many times if a, a Cooper's hawk flies overhead or in a nearby branch, suddenly you'll feel this explosion of air and poof, every bird suddenly disappears, taking cover. So there's a lot of alarm behaviors. The birds know that they're concentrated, um, they are targets for predators, and you can watch them constantly signaling one another to look out for danger. Maintenance behaviors, feeding of course, and I mentioned a little bit about how different species of birds feed in different ways, either hanging out and just monopolizing the feeder or taking their little seed and flying away. Drinking, again, if you don't have a lot of just water nearby, have a bird bath or a dish of water out and you'll see the birds using it regularly. Preening and sunbathing, you know, they'll stay close to the, the food source, maybe in a shrub nearby, and you'll watch them preening and grooming. Birds need to keep their feathers in top shape because it's those feathers and the down underneath that keep them from getting hypothermia in the winter and keep them from having injuries to their skin, their protection as well. And But those only happen if the birds are constantly grooming, putting oil on their feathers, keeping their, their coat in top shape. So you can watch them doing that. So behaviors are just a great part of why we put bird feeders out. We know it's good for the birds and we know we love their colors and their sounds, but watching their behaviors and how they interact is as the more you learn, the more you, it, mesmerizing it becomes. So let's take a look at some of the different birds that you're going to see as you put out your feeders or if you have them out. Here's our chickadee. We have two types, the black cap chickadee, which I have on my opening slide. It's our classic chickadee with the, the buffy flanks and the black cap on its head, thin little beak and a long tail. However, he has a cousin, the chestnut back chickadee that looks very similar. The head's not quite as big, but it has this beautiful nutmeg chestnut brown on the back and underneath the wings on the flanks. And you'll know one when you see one fly in. They're just a beautiful, beautiful color. In our area, the black-capped chickadee is everywhere. So even if you're living in a condo or an apartment and you can only have a little debt feeder out on your deck or hanging from uh, a window, you'll get black-capped chickadees coming around. The chestnut bat kind of like woodsy areas more. So if you live anywhere near a green belt, you'll get chestnut back chickadees coming in. However, in the winter time of year where nat natural foods are scarce, if you have a good feeder out, you'll get chestnut backs coming in too because they're looking for food and um, they're, they're very happy to stray from their more comfortable level of green belt areas right into condos or apartment buildings to get a bit of food. And it's kind of fun to see the difference between the two. Is it chestnut backed or is it a black cap? And you will get them both coming in. One quick little aside about these birds is that, man, there are times I wish I were a chickadee because in the fall, chickadees grow their brains. Now think about that for a minute they actually add brain mass, uh, up to a third of the total size of their brain in the fall and winter. And it all has to do with cells that deal with memory because not only eating the seed from your feeder at the moment is what they do, but they cache the seeds, meaning they'll come and take seeds and stash them in the barks, bark crannies of a nearby tree, in your gutters, under shingles, anywhere that there's a spot where they can cache it and their brain cells multiply so that they can remember over a thousand different individual cache sites to come back to later. You know, they're like, you know, the proverbial getting ready for winter, like there may be a food shortage, so we're gonna put food away and they remember where they can go and get those seeds. Then in the spring, when the, the time of um, uh, low food and cold weather is over, those brain cells shrink away and they're replaced by some cells that are more involved with finding, selecting a mate and territory. But in the fall, they grow their brains. I wish I could grow my brain. Very fascinating. Everything in nature is smarter than we think it is. Another bird you'll surely get is the house finch. House finch is a kind of a brownish bird with a brick red wash over its face, its head, down the back of its neck, 
a little on the breast and you can see a little bit under the wings on the tail. And it has that thick, heavy beak that makes a finch a finch. Now, uh, finches are a little more slender than sparrows, which we'll see in a minute. Sparrows tend to be a little more chunky bodied. Finches are a little bit leaner bodied. And the finches will come. This is the bird that's going to hang out at your feeder and just eat to its heart's content until some other birds say, okay, Charlie, that's enough. Let somebody else in here and, and run them off. The females don't have that brick wet red wash. They're just kind of a brown streaky bird. But you'll get these guys in, they're native, they're very cool birds, and that brick red um, when they're in fresh breeding plumage is, is very, very pretty. So the house finch and chickadees, for sure you're gonna get those. Now, if you've never seen a pine siskin before, this is the year you're gonna see pine siskins. I'll explain more in a minute. The pine siskin is a type of finch because it has a slender body, but you'll notice the beak is not the thick beak. Let me just back up a minute. See that thick beak on the house finch, that heavy cracking beak like the goldfinch? The pine siskin has a more slender pointed beak, not as thick. And it, though it's, although it's streaked, can you see a little faint bit of yellow on the wings? little bit of yellow there. So it looks like a female house finch, but the house finches do not have that yellow on them. So little streaks of yellow identify the pine siskins. This year, pine siskins are everywhere. As I said, if you haven't seen them before, this is the year you're going to see them. Um, uh, there's a huge uh, eruption, meaning a explosion of these finches all through North America outside of their range, going way far south. There are finches that are native to Canada that are being seen down in New Mexico and down in Florida. And pine siskins are native to our area, they're resident birds. But boy, we are seeing them in huge, huge numbers. Um, scientists are theorizing that there's been a great abundance of pine and fir conifer seeds which is collectively known by the word mast, M-A-S-T. So the mast product from conifers has been huge this year. And so lots more young birds are making it to adulthood and they're flying all over further south in their range looking for continued food and territory. So whereas I'd have siskins pretty regularly, but in small groups at my feeder, when they're coming this year, they're coming by the dozens. So, and everyone all across the country is experiencing this. So this is a boom year for siskins and you'll surely see these guys. Again, they look like a house finch, but a thinner bill and they have yellow, which the house finch does not. You'll also get the red-breasted nuthatch, which is a bird that has a slate blue back, got a black line through its eye, kind of looks like a chickadee at first glance, but it doesn't have the full black cap and it's got a beautiful red breast. It look, kind of looks more orange to me. This is a bird that has a call that you'll hear a lot. It's an onomatopoeia. So there's a great word for you. You know, the word that's what it sounds like, and it's yank. So you'll hear this bird. <coughs> on and on and on. You get the idea. That's the red-breasted nuthatch. And although they are primarily insect eaters, in the winter they will come and get seed readily. And you can see this one, they're very good at hanging upside down and he's cracking the seeds of a, this Port Orford seed cone, but they will come by and get black oil sunflower and suet. The dark-eyed junco, here's our snowbird. Very distinctive because it has a black cowl that covers over its head, down the back of its neck, and then down in front, kind of like Batman's cowl. That contrasts with that kind of pale pinkish yellow pink bill and then of course, dark eyed junco because it's got a dark eye. These birds, in, instead of going up on your tube feeders to eat, like to be underneath them on the ground, picking up any spilled seed. So they're nice, they're keeping your yard nice and tidy. When seed gets spilled, you'll see juncos and sparrows down on the ground picking up the spilled seed. They still sometimes will fly up and get on your feeder, but look for these guys on the ground. And the fact that they congregate in the winter as I mentioned, gives rise to that old saying, the snowbirds are back. Well, this is the bird they're talking about, the dark-eyed junco. Now, Carly talked about sparrows and that you'll see a lot of sparrows and they can be kind of tricky to identify. Um, I can tell you more if you come out on a bird walk with me, but let me just give you a quick, two quick tips. 
when you're seeing sparrows, which are chunkier bodied than the finches, first of all, the breast, is it plain or is it streaked? In this golden crown sparrow, the breast is plain. If you can first of all see whether it's plain or streaked, you can immediately winnow out about half the possibilities to what sparrow it is. The second thing is many sparrows have markings on their head or around their eyes that are distinctive. And the golden crown sparrow has this black eyebrow and then a beautiful gold, uh, like, like a football helmet striped down the center of a football helmet, right down the top of its head. And it has kind of a cool song that's sort of, oh, poor dear me, very whistly kind of song you'll hear in your yard. Now, this is a golden crown sparrow a little later in the season in August. And as I said, feathers or take a beating and they're important. That's why birds, most birds molt twice a year, replenish their feathers. So you can see the difference between this golden crown sparrow that's kind of looked like it's been a tough year. And it has, hasn't it, for all of us compared with this guy who's in the fresh breeding plumage. This is the, the bird in the breeding plumage you're more likely to see this time of year because all these birds are getting their best breeding plumage on get in anticipation of uh, courtship and mating season. So the golden crown sparrow, and then you might get the white crown sparrow. Breast is plain, right? Just gray, no streaks. And it's got like a bicycle helmet that's black and white striped. Beautiful white crowned sparrow. He has a pretty cool song too. White crown singing in the garden. Very distinctive song. You'll see those and sparrows like the junco, which is a sparrow, like to hang around at the base of the feeders and clean up your seeds. So they may not be on the feeder, but they certainly will be on the ground catching any spilled seed. And our song sparrow, streaked breast, right? And you'll notice in the center Streaks kind of make a brown circular blue, distinctive for the song sparrow. And the song sparrow has a gray eyebrow. So look at the breast, look at the face and head for the markings. And this guy, for some reason, sings all year long, not just during spring courtship and mating season. So, and I call him the Beethoven's fifth bird because typically his song starts out with the motive of Beethoven's fifth, you know, fate knocks at the door. Deep, 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 deep. So these guys will come around the base of your feeder picking up spilled seed. A non-native sparrow that we have is the house sparrow um, or the English sparrow. It's got a lot of chestnut on the back of the head. It's got a big thick beak for cracking seeds and a plain breast. The spotted towhee at first glance might look like a robin, but the red breast isn't, doesn't extend to the front. There's white down the center of the breast and look at that red eye. And the white bar, mar, barring the marks on the wings are how it gets its name, spotted towhee. This guy will hang around in the shrubbery underneath your feeder and be one of the birds that's cleaning up the seed off the ground. Very cool bird with a lot of vocalizations. Now, if you hang suet, you're going to get bush tits. These guys believe in safety and numbers and they're very gregarious. You'll see on your suet feeder, 15, 12, 15, 20 of these birds all at once. And boy, are they nervous Nellies because they're constantly looking for danger. And if one sees anything that it thinks startles it, suddenly they'll all explode and fly away. And then 10 seconds later, 15 seconds later, they're back feeding again. So they come in in a big rush, leave in a big rush. They basically just a small gray bird with kind of a brown head and a long tail that got, kind of got cut off in this photo. Sorry about that. But they love suet and you'll see clusters of them, you'll know they're bush tits. And if you're really lucky, you'll get this cousin of the American robin, the varied thrush. These birds spend the summer up in the mountains and come down and spend the lowland, lowlands, share the lowlands with us during winter. It has the same orange color as a robin, but look at that bib, that dark bib across the breast, and then a golden eyebrow. So you might see this bird hiding out in the shrubs near your feeder and coming out to snare a spare seed or two, the varied thrush. And then our resident hummingbird, the Anna's hummingbird with that beautiful gold, ruby red gorget and the green on the back, sort of a pale whitish buffy breast. These guys are just amazing. And I mentioned the importance of having hummingbird food out for them. But boy, the tongue of a hummingbird is something else. Let me share this with you. 
The hummingbird's tongue is about twice as long as its beak, so it can reach deep into a flower. And until recently, many scientists believed that the birds relied heavily on capillary action to draw the nectar through their tongues and into their mouths. Kind of like water spontaneously rising up a thin straw in a glass. But some fascinating discoveries at the University of Connecticut have shown that the mechanisms involved are much more dynamic than anyone realized. The hummingbird's tongue is actually a nectar trap equipped with a pair of narrow tubes that taper sharply. The tip of each tube is segmented into a row of flaps that are attached to a supporting rod. When the bird isn't eating, these flaps form two rows of closed loops that fit compactly into the beak. But when the hummingbird feeds, its tongue undergoes a dramatic transformation. Inside the flower, the tongue extends to make contact with the nectar. When immersed in fluid, the tip splits and the flaps on each fork systematically unfurl. Then as the tongue is withdrawn, the flaps close tightly to seal and capture the nectar for delivery into the bird's mouth. This entire process is executed automatically, 20th of a second, thousands of times a day. From flower to flower to flower to flower, this brilliant iridescent body, there's a kind of jewel-like quality that they have. This exquisite workmanship, the colors and the sound that they make. I think in some respects, the wonder of a hummingbird almost transcends language. And we respond to what we see at a level, really you could say deeper than rationality. I mean, it's not irrational, but it's almost like responding to the work of an artist. And at that level, we respond with our soul, with our emotions. What can you say? Words can't do it justice. So you just stand there and applaud. So if you don't have a hummingbird feeder out there, doesn't that make you want to go out and put one out. They are just amazing. Anyway, enjoy fall and winter birding. Hope this was helpful for you. Thank you very much. And um, if we have some time, I think Carly said we might have some question and answer. Yeah, and I just had some great comments too, where Robin says that she's able to watch the tongue from below entering the nectar in the feeder, which is really, really neat. Thank you for sharing that. Um, yeah, one of the questions we had was, can birds get dependent on us for feeding them instead of learning or being able to find food on their own? Um, the answer, no, not at all. That's a, a common mis misperception that people have. Um, birds are very adaptable and all birds have wings and can fly. So if you put up food and they're feeding it and say you go on vacation, maybe a week, maybe two weeks, a month, guess what? Birds will just fly off and find a different Different food source. Now they'll keep checking back, back at your feeders to see if anything's there, but they're very, very capable of moving on and finding an alternative food source if yours is empty for any reason. Then when you come back from your vacation, put food in the feeder and the birds will be back eating. So you're not making them dependent or habituated to you at all. They're very adaptable and very flexible. If your food source temporarily it goes dormant, they'll move on and find something else. So um, no downside at all to it. Feed those birds. <laughs> and as far as feeding goes, Sharon was asking about a no mess feed. And we also had, you know, people asking about how to deal with feeding um, birds versus the rats. So 
That's a um, question of two. <laughs> you can buy black oil sunflower seed that's been shelled and put in a roller and crushed. Mm -hmm. I know at Audubon, Seward Park Audubon and Seattle Audubon, we have, it's called patio mix and it's basically black oil sunflowers without the shell. So if you don't want any shell mess on the ground beneath the feeder, patio mix, the shelled sunflower seeds is the way to go. You can also purchase their little net uh, discs that hang beneath the seed feeder that will catch a lot of the droppings and the birds can just land on that little disc. It's usually a mesh disc and they can eat off of that. In terms of, of rodents, here, here's the reality. Our city is overrun with invasive rats. In fact, every city is in the United States. They're all shipboard stowaways, black rats, roof rats, Norway rats, all in the genus Rattus, R-A-T-T-U-S, where they get their name. And um, they're everywhere. They're in my backyard. They're in your backyard. The best we can hope for is to keep them out of our house. Thank goodness we have our urban coyotes and our, our owls because they clean up on these rats. That's a big part of their diet. If you put bird seed out, um, you may get some rats coming around to investigate it, but they're going to be in your backyard whether there's seed there or not. Just make sure you keep them out of your house. Um, if you're concerned, neighbors are concerned, or you have covenants at your locale, um, you can get the, the shelled uh, black oil sunflower, the patio mix, so there's no shell debris. The ground feeding birds that I mentioned, particularly a lot of the sparrows and the towhees, will come and clean up a lot of the mess on the ground before the rats can get to it as will the squirrels. Um, if it gets to be too bad, I've advised people, you know, if you're seeing rats all the time and they freak you out, discontinue, bring your seed feeder in or your suet feeder in and leave it in for a week or so. The rats are gonna need, you're hungry and they'll go elsewhere to find their food. Then reintroduce the feeders, the birds will come right back and feed on them. So there's no way you can get rid of the rats. They're here and um, they're gonna continue to be here. You just wanna minimize um, their frequency in your yard, but you don't want to stop feeding the birds because of that. And just also remember there are, um, you know, some people will use rat poison, but if you uh, use rat poison, yeah. owls are eating those rats. So it's actually poisoning those birds. So it's the whole cycle to keep in mind as we are trying to feed the birds yeah. as well. The anticoagulant, uh, which is the toxin that's in, in, the, in the rat poison, uh, stays active. It, it's, it, it doesn't break down inside the, the prey. And when that rat is eaten by any other predator, or even, you know, that your, your cat or your neighbor's cat, that substance goes into that animal and is toxic to it as well. So Great. no, no, uh, no chemical poisons, please. And you had that, that great video. Someone was asking what the source of the video was or where they could find that documentary on uh, hummingbirds. Um, it's on YouTube, Hummingbirds in, in Nature, Hummingbirds in Action, I think it was. Yeah. I can't remember the company that put it out. Um, okay. Yeah. yeah. And I just think you can Google Hummingbirds on the yeah. video too, which is great. Um, and we had another question that someone had a chickadee family living in the birdhouse last spring, but it looks like there's a dead bird inside there. Is it advisable to try to clear it? Is now a good time? Yeah, now's a fine time. Yeah, take the house down, take the roof off or whatever portion to give you access, clean all of it out, um, bring it, like if you have a garage or a shed, put it inside somewhere where it's not out in the elements and just let it totally dry out over the winter and then put it back up again. And for chickadees, they can be early nesters. So I would put it up um, after President's Day in February, after Valentine's Day. And they'll start looking for nesting spots into February 1st of March. And uh, Karen says that they've had issues with crows demolishing their suet bricks quickly. Are there, is there any advice for dealing with crows? Um, they, they make double cage feeders that make it a little harder, but crows are so darn smart. Um, they, they'll find a way. You know, the, a bird that I, we have that, and I have in my yard that's a real pest is the, the, the Eurasian starling. Um, starlings are not native to here, but, you know, they were released by some fellow in the 1880s in Central Park in New York that was a Shakespeare fan, and he thought that every bird mentioned in a Shakespeare play should be in the New World, and so we've found ways to get all these birds from Europe from Shakespeare plays and release them. And he released a few starlings in Central Park. 
oh, fast forward 100 years and they've taken over the continent. They'll get on your suet feeder and they will just you know, ravage it. So when they get to be too, and they, and boy, they're always fighting and it's, so I bring the suet feeder in, I keep it hidden for a few days. The starlings go off to find some other food source and harass whoever has that out. And then I'll put my suet feeder back out. So you can just bring it in for a few days, but crows and starlings, there's just no way to, to keep them away to entirely. They're just too smart, too, too clever and, and too mobile. And I think um, here, these last questions we'll close with because it's in relation to the counts as well of, of having some recommendations of either source resources for identifying birds by call or any books um, people can be using. Do you have certain recommendations? Um, there's a great app called LarkWire, L-A-R-K-W-I-R-E, that has um, not only bird songs, but it has a uh, fun little games that you can play, like it'll pick four, finds out your location, Washington, you know, four birds common in meadows. They'll have a, an American robin, and I can't remember the four, and they, you can, you know, play the song, and if you hit yes for what that you think that bird is, and you guess wrong, a little red bird foot stomps you, and if you say yes, and then a happy bird flies away, and you can keep repeating that. Um, that's a, a, a good way to do it. Um, the Corn Cornell Laboratory of Ornithology, um, from Cornell University has a website called All About Birds and all the bird species there, they have vocalizations. The best way to learn bird songs is to go out with someone who's a good birder by ear and just spend time with them and learn from them. Um, and I do, I'm a good birder by ear and I love to take people out and sort of demystify, you know, this, all, this, all these sounds and how can you start to categorize them. So that's the absolute best way is to go out with someone who knows the bird songs and um, will show you what they are and keep repeating them. And I remember when I first started getting into the birding by ear, I thought, what, this is like overwhelming. But you know what, it isn't. And with a good instructor and some good resources, many times you don't see the bird, but if you know the vocalization, you can spot it and you get the same dopamine poof, that you do from seeing it. So, hey, why wouldn't you? Yeah, and you can make those games yourselves by using the Audubon app, using the Merlin app. And I recommend playing those things indoors so you get used to hearing them and then going outdoors because if you're playing them outdoors, depending on the season, it may be triggering some responses in those animals, some behaviors where they're having to be on alert when they're a little malnourished from traveling long distances or they're really threatened because they're hearing the sound versus a whistle that you're doing. So it's good to, to get all those things figured out with your headphones or indoors and then test yourself when you go outside. And yeah. having a field guide on hand is really important. I mean, you can do them online, you can use Sibley's. I like trustworthy um, books and I just use these as my log books to, to look in there yeah, yeah. and also see what bird is where and when. So there are plenty of resources out there. We will try to continue that conversation um, offline because it's, it's always continuing, which is great. So yeah. I think you, Ed, for sharing all these insights, um, all these specifics with us and for opening, expanding our minds and our tongues <laughs> in different <laughs> ways. Um, there's so much great information here. And thank you everyone for tuning in. You're making a difference for birds just by being here. So I, I invite you to think of one bird right now that either you saw tonight or that you know of that's special to you. And, and think about how that bird makes you feel because that makes a difference. So whether you're participating in the counts or whether you're just looking outdoors, share this love with other people and continue um, to uplift birds in, in ways that you can. So thank you all. We appreciate you. your part and we'll hope to see you in some way at BirdFest and, and just in the love of birds. So yeah. tweets. <laughs>